Thank you all for uh, for joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to this session. Uh, you know, we're really, even though the, the topic was sort of just generally Airflow 2.0 on our Amazon managed workflows for Apache Airflow, we really want to sort of branch into a little bit more about the service and uh, how we're working with uh, the open source community. So we'll start out with just explaining how we're doing Airflow. Uh, you know, Airflow is this wonderful open source software, as you all know, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to set it up. There's a lot of ways to do it. And so we want to make sure, you know, we understand sort of where we, we uh, landed as far as how we're doing the service. Uh, then after that, we want to really under explain how we intend on staying current uh, for uh, the next 2.0 versions or 2.x versions and beyond, uh, how we're going to handle, you know, sort of keeping current with upgrades and that sort of thing. And then the last section is really about how we're staying open and, and contributing to the service. So what we've done today and what we're planning on doing moving forward and, and how we're planning on supporting the open source community. So we're going to start out with just how we're doing open source or how we're doing Airflow. So we released uh, uh, with uh, our managed Airflow service back in November of last year, uh, and then we added 2.0 support back in May. Uh, you know, we really, you know, spoke to a lot of customers. We really, you know, uh, Airflow users primarily that wanted to just uh, ask how we can, you know, make it easier, make it easier to set up and, and use this, this awesome, uh, awesome Airflow software. And so when we were deciding what to do with this, we had to, you know, make certain decisions on, on the, what we, uh, what we wanted to offer. Now, the first thing we want to offer, as you can see here, there's no forks whatsoever. Our first tenant and our top tenant was we're always going to just offer the same open source version of Airflow uh, that everyone's in using and enjoying and, and loving today. And so uh, that was our number one tenant. Beyond that, we wanted to make sure we provided some architectural options that gave customers the most flexibility as possible. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sam. Great. Right, thanks, John. So in this diagram, you see the architecture diagram for um, managed workflows for Apache Airflow. And as John was mentioning, our sort of being uh, open and visible to our, our service is really important to us as one of our top tenants. And to that end, being very open about the architecture that powers the managed service as well. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of these components so I give you a sense of what they are, especially as you're thinking about mapping your experience in a self-managed environment to what you can uh, find and, and manage your flow. First thing to note is each of these orange boxes are compute containers running on something called ECS Fargate. Fargate is a serverless container execution environment where you describe the execution uh, container, but we manage the underlying compute for you. The managed airflow components are really separated into two categories, those that run inside the service team's VPC, which you can see on the right, and those that run inside of <clears throat> your VPC as a customer. A VPC is a virtual private cloud. This is your private definition of a network inside of AWS where you have control over the CIDR blocks and subnets for your own network topology. So on the right-hand side, you can see in the service team's VPC that we have the meta database. Uh, this metadata this is an Aurora Postgres database, uh, which is already a sort of a, a highly available uh, cloud-native relational database running inside the AWS. And below that, you'll see the Airflow web server. This runs at least uh, two containers, so it has high availability um, out of the box. When you create an Airflow environment, um, we can uh, offer that in both a public and a private hosted environment. In the case of a public environment, you'll see we have a managed load balancer, an application load balancer that provides the public host name to the, your web servers. You can also choose a private web server option as well, in which case we create something called a VPC endpoint, which is a private DNS hosted um, uh, endpoint that can only be accessed um, from within your VPC. Inside of your VPC, uh, this is where we run the schedulers um, and the workers. Uh, as you can see, and especially Airflow 2.0, we can run um, a minimum of two schedulers up to five schedulers. And we also offer uh, a worker fleet that you can configure from anywhere from one to up to 25 maximum workers. And John will touch on a little bit more on how the scaling works. Down below, you see the supporting cast of services that we're using. And when you create a managed Airflow environment, you do bring an S3 bucket, a simple a storage service, uh, which is the, the green icon there, where you provide your DAGs. Um, but we also use these other AWS services to support the environment. So we use our CloudWatch metrics, logging, and dashboards, part of the CloudWatch service. We use a SQS service for queuing the work between the executor and the workers. Uh, we use the ECR, the Elastic Container Registry, to host the images that are deployed for the different Airflow components. 
And by default, all the data that's in your Airflow environment is encrypted um, at rest uh, by default using a key that's managed by the service team. However, you have the option to bring your own customer managed key as well. So as, as John was mentioning, we talked to a lot of customers when we were thinking about building this service. And what we heard from them is they love using Apache Airflow as, as engineers and, and software um, folks that are focusing on building uh, data processing applications. But it found the operational aspects of an environment challenging. And that's where we wanted to focus and bring value to customers. And we really cover that across four areas. The first is around deployment and operations of Airflow environments. The second is around availability and sizing. Uh, the third is around scaling of environments. And lastly, is around security integration with um, AWS services. So we're going to touch on each of these a little bit more detail, starting with deployment and operations. So as we heard from customers is that the provisioning of an, an Airflow environment could be challenging based on the multiple components that were required to be created and secured and patched and uh, in order to, to create a, a, an environment using best practices. And so Part of the uh, managed airflow environment is you describe how you'd like your environment to be configured, and then we manage uh, that provisioning of environments through automation. And that includes the initial uh, setup of the environment as well as any updates that you would require to that environment. So this makes it easier for customers to create multiple smaller environments that might be more suited to particular development teams or business units instead of larger um, multi-tenant environments as well. So it gives customers more flexibility and choice in the type of environments they want to create. The second area for this is that because it's easier to provision multiple environments, there's a more flexibility in creating multiple target environments. So we can now more easily support best practices around CI, CD pipelines and deploying our workflows into uh, multiple uh, non-production environments for uh, testing before they're deployed and progressed to a production environment. Um, next, we have, we're have we taking advantage of existing AWS capabilities in CloudWatch, as I mentioned, uh, the service that provides log aggregation and analytics using something called CloudWatch logs. Um, metrics capturing, so all the CloudWatch, uh, all the Apache Airflow metrics that are produced are captured as CloudWatch metrics. And these allow you to create thresholds for different values for those. Uh, you can create alarms, so when things should notify when they cross those thresholds, and even do things like percentile measurements. So instead of just talking about the average metrics, you can actually talk about the, the 90th percentile or the 95th percentile of a particular metric. Those metrics can be used to build custom dashboards. You can see that to the right here in this diagram. This is an example of a CloudWatch um, dashboard that's used to monitor multiple uh, managed airflow environments uh, using CloudWatch metrics. So it makes it very easy to create your own custom uh, dashboards for the, the um, either the built-in metrics that are important to you or your own custom application metrics combined in a single pane of glass. And lastly, around the infrastructure uh, provisioning of, of these environments, we do support CloudFormation, which is our uh, you know, infrastructure as a cloud, which provides a declarative way through JSON or YAML syntax to describe the AWS resources and their configurations that you might want to use. However, we also support open source options as well, like Terraform. And this is a, a great way that you can uh, codify your Airflow environment configurations so that you can deploy and update those in a consistent way across multiple environments and across multiple teams. So when we're looking at, you know, in, you know, in that, uh, in the diagram that, that Sam shared with you, um, you know, all those compute um, components, those ECS Fargan components, we need to choose how do you size them and how do you scale them? Uh, you know, there is a certain amount of CPU processing and RAM and things like that that are available. Um, so what we're allowing you to do is basically pick a, a, a set of sizes based upon your approximate workload. Now, this is highly subjective. We can, you know, as everyone here knows, you could have one DAG that's running incredibly complex things and, and takes a ton of resources. Uh, but this is sort of how we broke it down in, in, in our setup was sort of a one, two and four vCPU for each of those containers. Um, and so, you know, for each environment, so in a small environment, each environment gets one, one vCPU each. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out too is that when we added 2.0 support, um, we, we actually just provided everybody a second scheduler by default. We didn't change any pricing or anything else. We just simply included that same size as it was with 1.10, but now you get two of them instead of one. We wanted to make sure that these had the, uh, the, the availability uh, that's expected on this.
And then for the workers, uh, we're running celery um, uh, for the the workers, which I, I think, uh, at least as of the the last uh, survey I looked, I think was still the majority of, of Airflow users uh, were were taking advantage of. And um, as you know, there needs to be at least one celery executor per environment, so we provide that by default. Uh, you can choose to have more than one as your sort of that base level, but you need to have at least one. And then for the actual scaling, we're simply using those exact same. Uh, metrics that uh, Sam just shared with you uh, and we're simply monitoring those metrics and determining um, whether or not we need extra containers up to the maximum you specified. So you can see here you can specify a maximum number of workers um, and so the math there is pretty simple. We just add together how many tasks are running plus how many are queued up. We divide those by you know based on the size of these containers how many tasks will reliably execute for each one uh, that's that same celery worker auto scale um, setting that I think some of you are probably familiar with. And you divide that and it tells us how many containers you should have. So we just t simply take the, uh, the lesser of the maximum you've chosen or the, um, the number that's recommended here. And that's what we, we scale up to. Um, for scaling down, in order to do it so we can make sure that we don't interrupt any running tasks, we actually wait until that same... Uh, sum of metrics that same you know tasks running plus task queued equals zero so we we assume that uh, if there's nothing running and nothing queued it's obviously safe to dispose of those extra workers and you're back down to your minimum worker count which is by default one but can be higher if you have sort of more sustained workload that you're expecting and then for security um, you know, providing sort of that authorization, um, uh, both there's, and there's the two levels of authorization, right? There is who's allowed to access the user interface. And then there's also what is that airflow environment allowed to access and where does it, da its data come from? And so much like, uh, what Sam showed in, in our architecture, where really, you know, uh, we've implemented, uh, airflow as just a, you know, the same, um, services that you could build airflow with yourself on aws so you don't you know you can use those exact same services like sqs and, and s3 and, and ecs fargate and such like that uh we did very much the same with with the authentication so we're using uh im which is the uh identity and access management built into uh that all of the console pages and things like that that aws uses we're actually using that for the airflow user interface as well so you can map the built-in airflow roles to one of those um to a policy that the same users that they would have access to if you want to give them grants to access s3 or access emr or some other aws console service works exactly the same way you can just say okay well this user is a viewer in this airflow environment or this user is uh, an administrator in this other airflow environment, we're able to do that. And, and then from there, you know, that IAM in turn supports things like Federation to Okta and SAML2 and things like that. So by leveraging built-in uh, AWS services, we can get the advantages and all the infrastructure that was built into those. Uh, and again, these are a lot of the same things you could, you could do yourself if you were building your own airflow on, on AWS. Um, Similarly, we wanted to make sure that customers uh, and, and, and users would have no trouble getting at the data they want to get at. So by running the, um, by running the workers and the scheduler in the, these, those virtual private cloud that's defined uh, in, in your account, it makes it easy for you to just simply use the existing tools there to connect things. If I want to connect to on-premises uh, data with uh, Direct Connect or other services, or I want to connect to other accounts, that can all be done that way. And we use the security groups to manage how what sort of traffic is allowed through there. Uh, just to make it a lot easier to configure the environment where you know that it's safely and it's sort of secure by default as well. Um, we do have support for AWS Secrets Manager as a secrets backend. We didn't write that, of course. That's the same open source uh, secrets manager support that you can run yourself. Uh, we just simply provided, um, you know, that as a sort of a, uh, a make sure we had the, the ability to do that out of the box. Um, and then you just provide the configuration overrides to do that. And then the last item on here is really around the execution role. So I mentioned off the top that, you know, there's that who can see Airflow, but then there's also what can Airflow do. Now, typically that's done through, you know, your connections or through, um, uh, you know, or through a backend secret, you know, like a secrets manager. Uh, what we've done in this service is, you know, uh, AWS uh, containers, whether it be EC2 or ECS or what have you, have the ability to assume a role. So just like there's that role that the users have 
where they say, okay, well, there's a policy in here that says I can access this Airflow user interface and I can go do so. Uh, similarly, you can say have a role that the Airflow environment assumes where it says, okay, well, you're allowed to talk to EMR or you're allowed to talk to Redshift or you're allowed to talk to this, this S3 bucket in this other account somewhere. And you can do all that from the uh, from this execution rule rather than managing it all as connections. And the benefit there is it gives you some additional granularity that you might not otherwise have. And perhaps more importantly, as Sam was saying around doing, you know, the deployment and the centralized infrastructure using things like CloudFormation and Terraform, it means that you can actually stand up an environment, say who's allowed to access it and what it's allowed to access without ever at going to the Airflow user interface or touching the meta database or any other data like that. It's all sort of built in out of that and ready to go for you as part of that deployment. And then speaking of deployments, I'll hand it to Sam for to talk about how CI CD works. Thanks, John. So in that architecture diagram that I, I covered, um, all of those components are provided for you as part of a managed airflow environment. That's part of the value proposition of the managed service. The one AWS resource that you need to come to an environment with though is an S3 bucket. If you're not familiar with S3, it's a simple storage service. It's a managed um, object storage service. Uh, the first service that ever went GA for AWS. And it's a, it's a very unopinionated target to store uh, objects of any types and sizes. And so uh, we do ask that you bring that to your environment. You have that created when you create an environment. The only constraints on that is that it needs to have versioning turned on, which is just a checkbox configuration that you can set on a bucket. And we don't allow that bucket to have um, public access, which again is another configuration that you can just set. But outside of that, S3 is a very unopinionated target for storing artifacts. You know, as I said, it's, it's a general purpose object store. And why that's valuable uh, to you in thinking about CIC deployments into managed airflow is that it's very flexible to integrate with uh, existing CICD pipelines, right? So you might be using AWS services like Code Pipeline, for example, to deploy into multiple environments, or you might be using Jenkins or Bamboo or your own um, you know, GitHub Actions. I mean, it's very flexible. And most of these uh, CD pipeline services have S3 plugin integrations already, for example. So it's just a matter of building the artifact that you would like to deploy, targeting an S3 bucket and having the AWS credentials and whatever your CD pipeline software is. Very easy to and flexible to integrate. Um, now there's two types of updates that can happen inside of your managed airflow environment. There are the DAGs. So as you write DAGs, you can uh, put those inside of an S3 bucket. Again, that could be through a CD pipeline or as simple as copying through the AWS console. About every 30 to 60 seconds, we synchronize those DAGs um, using an, an S3 uh, sync command onto your enter environment. That happens automatically for you. About every 30 to 60 seconds, there's nothing for you to do. The other type of uh, updates you can make are to um, an optional uh, custom plugins um, zip file that you can choose to upload for your custom plugins or a requirements txt file for your near Python dependencies. Now, when you update these types of um, uh, resources, they're not automatically updated for you. There's actually an API call uh, or through the AWS console that you can choose to update the environment using the new version of these resources. And when you do that, we will do a rolling deployment of the components with your new uh, code. So it is uh, your, your uh, environment is still available to you, but you can expect that workers will be cycled, uh, you know, in, in sequence with the new uh, requirements as well. Um, so that's a different type of deployment. You still will update S3 with those artifacts, but then additionally, you'll do an update environment command to make those active. Okay, let's cover a couple of the uh, uh, best practices in managed airflow. So I'll talk a little bit about creating the environment and then turn it over to John. So there's a couple of, of things that you need to consider when you're uh, creating your, your managed airflow environment. The first is it, it's important since the resources, your workers and schedulers are running in your virtual private cloud, your private network in AWS, that you, you consider the networking configuration in your VPC. And when you create a managed airflow environment, for example, you can choose the private subnets that you would like uh, to, to schedule those containers and, and have access to the you know, networking resources in your VPC. So in, if you're already familiar with uh, AWS networking, there's nothing different to consider in how you would in, in configure a network for managed airflow than you would for you know, EC2 instances or containers or you know, other types of AWS uh, resources. 
Um, if you're new to AWS, this might be something that you would want to you know, read up on or do a little trial and error. We do have a template that you can install by a default, which will create a new VPC for you with all of the, everything set up for you <clears throat> automatically for you to create a new environment if you're new to it, but something to consider. Um, the sec is that you can choose again the public or the private host name for your environment. As John mentioned, we are using IAM access controls and securing access to that environment. So the security is the same from an, an AWS perspective. It's simply whether that host name is going to be public or private. If it's a private host name, then you need to consider that the clients that are connecting into your Airflow environment need to have essentially a private. VPC uh, connectivity so that they adopt a private IP address with that environment. And that can happen through VPN software, bastion hosts, or lots of flexibility there. Um, John mentioned execution roles, IAM execution roles. This is a, a really a, a some, not something I really understood very well as a customer of AWS before joining as a solutions architect. But you can think of this as uh, all of the automated mechanisms to practice best practices around security and least privileged access to AWS resources. So again, you simply describe a policy that describes what AWS resources and the, the access patterns to those resources, whether they're read or write access, you assign it to a role, that role gets associated to your environment. And then the actual AWS credentials, which are used to have the secure communication to all the services are created and rotated for you automatically. So you get both the benefits of least privileged definition of access as well as rotation out of the box. Um, for Python requirements, um, <clears throat> we do in our documentation describe uh, the compatibility versions and ways of uh, restricting the requirements text file uh, to those to test for those. And then for debugging purposes, we do have the, uh, uh, you know, all the log files that are accessible. You can go to the CloudWatch log service to look at those, or you can use the Airflow UI. The same logs that you're familiar with today are available through the UI. I'll mention at the end, we've also released a local runner. So it's actually uh, capable, possible to, to run a Docker container locally that emulates what's happening inside of managed Airflow so you can have a tighter inner, uh, uh, feedback loop as a developer when you're testing these requirements. And then lastly, there are some configuration options uh, to, to consider. So, you know, John mentioned some of the performance tuning. Uh, so we have flexibility again on the size of the environments as well as the number of uh, uh, workers and your configurations. So we do find customers will start with a certain configuration. They will test their workloads and, and determine whether that's right sized or not. But that's something you'll, you'll want to, to tune as you go. And then lastly, we do have secrets back in support. Um, we, we, uh, that come, as John mentioned, it's the same open source secrets manager, a back end support, uh, but that, that's the only one we offer today. Um, we'd like to offer more in the future, but that's something to consider too as, as a built in secrets management uh, integration. And then as far as sort of migration, so this is one thing that I know is a challenge. Um, you know, when developing a managed service, we had to pick something as an architecture, right? We had to pick some sort of compute and some sort of way of scaling it, some sort of way of distributing the various airflow services like the scheduler, the web server, etc. And for depending on if you're interested in going to a managed service, any managed service uh, from what you're currently self managing uh, with Airflow, there are some things to consider with that. You know, um, one of the things is really around sort of moving tasks off uh, some tasks off of the worker. So, you know, if you're running your own Airflow environment and you have, you know, virtually unlimited, you know, you have this huge EC2 instance, if it's running on AWS or, a, you know, your own sort of uh, virtual machines running locally or on, on pretty much anywhere, you have this huge pool of sort of resources you can go from, right? You can have as big a worker as you want. You can have as many, as much RAM or as many CPUs as you need. Um, you know, we made the choice to offer sort of a more serverless experience with ECS Fargate, as Sam was describing, that does have limitations. You can only go up to a maximum of four vCPUs and eight gigs of RAM. Um, it doesn't give you that sort of unlimited resources. So running a local Docker is really not practical because you're not going to run a little tiny Docker on, a, uh, uh, on an image. You really would want to move those off to something like if you're running on AWS and an ECS Fargate or maybe your own Docker um, um, set up on, on your own sort of self-managed. Um, similarly, you know, the way that these serverless containers for security purposes are set up is there's, uh, you know, you, it's really difficult to install things. So as far as custom runtimes, you have limited availability there. There are some ways to do it that are described in the, in the documentation, uh, but you just can't sort of install things arbitrarily. 
And so if you have a very complex sort of setup, um, you might be better off running those on an external container, running them on EKS, run them on ECS. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the, the sort of super, you know, large CPU or memory. Let's say you have your own sort of machine learning modeling. Um, you absolutely can run those on the worker. If you're self-managing, you can make the worker as big as you want. Um, whether that's a practical design or not, you know, it could be, could be argued either way, but, you know, we are limited to not being able to run sort of massive amounts of compute uh, on, uh, on the workers themselves. And, uh, you know, going along with that sort of custom run times is there's no pseudo access there. You can't run anything at, that requires sort of, you know, um, at that level of access on, on the workers themselves. Um, another thing around best practices, you know, we can scale up these workers, scale them down. Um, they may be replaced if they become unhealthy. So you really, when you're doing your workloads, you have to sort of assume that the workers are ephemeral. Assume that the next task might not run on the same worker as this task. Right. Even if it's not scaling, they may just, you know, so there's, you know, limited bash value there. If I'm running one bash operation as a bash operator and I run the next one after that, expecting a result somewhere similar on that container, it may not be running on that container. It might be running on a completely separate instance. And so, um, you know, really also when you're talking about, you know, the storage between tasks, you can't count on them just being on some local storage somewhere. You really got to think about, well, am I going to use, you know, maybe use XCOMs or maybe use S3 or some other centralized storage to do so. Uh, and then one other limitation around and best practice around migration is the, the web server is really locked down. So we, we wanted to make sure that we made it really easy for, for, for users and customers to go and set up an Airflow environment and access it just like any other console page. The downside with that is we really wanted to make sure that web server was very locked down. And we're working on sort of expanding that a little bit. Um, but for the moment, you know, we're not installing requirements on the web server that you define, even though we are installing them on the, the workers and the scheduler. Uh, and we're not s installing any Airflow UI plugins to date, although we are working on a, a way around that as well. Uh, and speaking of sort of development and, and, and work, I really want to get into sort of the open source contributions and sort of how we're planning on staying current with the Airflow community versions. So as far as staying current, our target is to provide minor versions within about 30 days. Now we're not there yet, uh, but that's the goal. So when, you know, uh, 2.1.2, uh, it was just released. I, I think I saw the announcement yesterday. You know, our goal would be ultimately be 30 days after that. So it'll be a little while before we can get to that cadence, but that's where we're going for. Uh, of course, a major release is going to take longer. Uh, I, how much longer, I don't know, because I don't know what the next major release will look like, but there are some wonderful sessions about that this week. Um, so that is one, um, one thing we'll have to sort of a to be, de be determined, but we also want to keep going the other way. We know there's a lot of, a lot of you out there that have 1.10 workloads that you're just not ready to upgrade yet. I know that, you know, the, the community really wants you to get onto that latest version, but maybe it's working fine, or we just don't want to go through the effort of updating all of our DAGs yet. So for, for. For those of you out there that want to keep that older version a little while longer, we're going to keep a 1.10 version available for as long as we can. Now, that is going to depend on if there's security issues or it becomes unstable for some reason or just no one's using it anymore. But that's our plan. Uh, and we will keep all of our versions, what's what's available, what you can do. We have a docs page that sort of lets you track the Airflow versions. It gives you some updates on how to how to best sort of migrate from one version to the next. Now, as far as open source contributions, we actually have a native EKS operator that our team has contributed. Uh, that's uh, the pull request is out there. It's it's I think very close to being accepted at this point. Um, you know that involved quite a bit of work. Uh, it wasn't just with the Airflow environment libraries. There were some uh, other libraries involved uh, that to improve that as well. Um, so there was thousands of lines of code that were involved in getting that working, with the goal of just making it easier to you know, to manage an a, a, a elastic Kubernetes cluster on, e, on AWS when running it from, from Airflow, make it easier to run your workloads that way. Uh, we also are improving the, uh, uh, the uh, AWS integrations to Airflow. So we've done some contributions to that already, uh, not just within Airflow too, but also within um, other sort of associated open source libraries uh, that, that go along with that. And we hope, and we're, our plan is to do a lot more of that. Uh, so really, you know, we want to get to the point where any of those issues that are tagged with uh, AWS as the provider, we really want to be the, the sort of the first folks that jump on that and get those get those sorted out for you. Um, 
we're also going to contribute to the to the the, the core airflow uh, capabilities. We really want to focus on uh, the things that our customers have talked about, which is really about the performance, the stability, and the, uh, any security improvements that can be done on there. Uh, and then we have a longer term sort of goal of having a you know developing a new executor that runs on natively on AWS server serverless and gives a lot more capability to uh, to really sort of run more expanding workloads uh, beyond what's available today. And I'll hand over to Sam to talk about what resources are available to you to uh, to help you with this. Great, thanks, John. <clears throat> so if you'd like to find out more about Managed Airflow, we do have a number of resources that you can reference. Uh, the first is our documentation. And we uh, regularly do updates to our documentation every Friday. And this includes you know, some of the references that John mentioned, but also code samples and improvements and clarifications to our documentation. So we have a very active cycle into doing documentation updates. So it's a very useful resource and it's something that you should come back to periodically uh, for information. Uh, the second course is our product page. And this is where you can find more of the marketing materials and links to other resources around managed airflow if you are uh, getting started or wanna share this information with others who are new to it. And then uh, we also have, we participate in the uh, Airflow AWS Slack channel. So members of, of John's team are there listening to uh, customer questions and we're monitoring that to help you. We have a GitHub repository with samples that you can check out as well. We have a number of samples there now, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's something that, uh, you know, if you're interested in contributing a sample as well, please uh, submit a pull request for us to consider. And then lastly, I mentioned earlier the local runner. So this is a project now where you can clone this repository, you can build a Docker image, and you can use that for local testing of your requirements, TXT file, any custom plugins. And it really improves sort of that uh, feedback loop as a developer as you're looking to migrate to manage Airflow or test any changes with these dependencies. Great. Thanks very much.